right, welcome everybody to another episode of the Nostalgia Trap Podcast. My name is David Parsons. I am happy you're listening to the show. Uh, you may have noticed that the show sounds a little bit differently lately, and I want to acknowledge the people that are involved in making it sound so much better than my unskilled hands can ever make it sound. Um, one is the band Chapo. That's no relation to the Chapo Trap House Podcast. This is the band Chapo with two Ps. They're from Brooklyn. They're like an indie rock band. They do like very like cool, psychedelic kind of stuff. I really love their music and I really appreciate them letting me feature their music on the show. I think it's the perfect tone. Uh, you can find their stuff on Spotify, iTunes, go to chapomusic.com and there's a bunch of stuff that they've put together on there uh, that you should check out. So thank you, Chapo. Uh, I also want to thank my my new producer and editor. I have someone who's actually helping me make the show sound much better than I could ever make it sound. And uh, his name is Peter Sabatino. Peter's been a, a friend of mine for a very long time. Uh, I'm very, very happy that he's working with me on the show and I look forward to, to what he contributes because I think he can put together some really awesome stuff. So new year, new president, new era, and a new sound for the nostalgia trap. I hope you enjoy it. My guest today is Michael Bush. Michael Bush is a senior editor at the, at the publication Warscapes. If you don't know what Warscapes is, go to warscapes.com uh, and check out what they've got going because this is a publication that, that, that covers war in a very, very different way than most media sources cover it, and that's kind of part of the impetus behind the whole project. Um, but I want to read the just the, the, the opening paragraph of describing, uh, this is from their, their website, describing what they're all about because they say it so much more eloquently than I could ever say it. So this is from their site. It says, uh, Warscapes is an independent an online magazine that provides a lens into current conflicts across the world. Warscapes publishes fiction, nonfiction, poetry, interviews, book and film reviews, photo essays, and retrospectives of war literature from the past 50 years. Warscapes is motivated by a need to move past a void within mainstream culture in the depiction of people and places experiencing staggering violence and the literature they produce. Apart from showcasing great writing from war-torn areas, the magazine is a tool for understanding complex political crises in various regions and serves as an alternative to compromise representations of those issues. So, you know, th this is a, a magazine with a mission. It's also beautifully produced. Um, you should check out Warscapes. And Michael Bush is a senior editor over there. He's been involved with the, with the project for a while, and he tells me a lot about, you know, how he got involved and what they're trying to do and what, they're, or what they, they have done or are going to do in the future. But, you know, Michael is also a student at the CUNY Graduate Center, he told me about his own work. He taught, he works on uh, like uh, organized crime um, from an international perspective, particularly when it, when it comes to South America. So I had a really great time talking to Michael Bush, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. You can find more Nostalgia Trap conversations at nostalgiatrap.com. You can also find always find the latest episode pinned to the top of my Twitter at David L. Parsons. And if you find it in your heart to give me a few dollars on the donate page, there's a donate button on nostalgiatrap.com that you can you can press and they can tell you what to do. So thank you so much for listening. This is me talking to Michael Bush of Warscapes. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, we know each other, I think, mainly from CUNY Graduate Center. That's right. Um, when did you when did you arrive at the CUNY Graduate Center? We can start there and then we'll do the like we can go backwards. But Sounds like good, yeah. when did you arrive at the CUNY Graduate Center? I, I got there in the oh man, it's been a long time. I got there in the fall of two thousand and eight, I okay. think it was. So about eight years ago. Okay. And yeah. you're in in what department? Political science. Okay. So I, I came with the intention of uh, studying international relations, um, which is what I did there for a number of years. Um, where, where are you from originally? I'm originally from New York City. I'm from the Lower East Side of New York City. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So you, uh, were you, did you go to high school down there? You went to like no, literally once, raised in the Lower yeah. East Side? So I, I, went to, I went to a public school um, on First Avenue, PS19, which is, I think, no longer there. It's the Asher Levy School um, nearby sort of Stuyvesant Village, that area. Um, so I was there from kindergarten through sixth grade. Uh, but I also went to the boys club over on Avenue A. Mm. And so... After a few years there, um, they, they introduced me to a scholarship program um, that was designed to sort of funnel kids into the private school network. And so in seventh grade, I went to a school called St. Luke's, which is over on Hudson Street on yeah. the West, in the West Village. Um, and I was there for two years. Um, and then I got another scholarship to go to a school called Packer, which is in downtown Brooklyn. Um, so it's right on Jerolman Street now mm -hmm. by the, the courthouses. Um, yeah. And so I went there for four years and then 
graduated, went to college um, in Maryland. And so I was there. I was there for two years, kind of took a year off or dropped out, whatever mm-hmm, you want to mm-hmm. call it. And then, uh, you know, worked and, and did a number of different things and then came back for another two years in Maryland. And then after I graduated there, I came back to New York City. Um, and then I started immediately, sort of after I got back, I, I began teaching. So I was an elementary school teacher for about six years. I guess, oh, wow. In total. Um, was that something that came as a surprise to you that you ended up as an elementary school teacher at that moment? Or is it something no. that you'd been, has teaching been a part of your your direction for a while? Yeah, I, I think it was a little bit of both. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's sort of hazy now, sort of thinking back. So, you know, I feel like I'm sort of reinventing the history a little bit. But um, that's yeah, what we do, I, right? Yeah. That is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, I mean, it, it, in my senior year of college, um, I had I had more or less committed to the idea of, of coming back to New York um, and coming back with, uh, with the intention of teaching in a New York City public school. And I didn't really have a clear sense uh, at that time of what that would look like or where it would be. Um, but that was sort of the plan um, as it stood. And then, so, and then I mean, yeah. where does that where does that impulse come from and to, to teach? Because, you know, there are so many different cultural attitudes about right. teaching, um, mm-hmm. a lot of really shitty cultural attitudes about teaching. But yeah, there are also there's also kind of like uh, this weird kind of support our troops esque mm-hmm. kind of uh, lip service right. to teaching as an idealistic kind of service. But, but right. I mean, how are you conceiving of teaching? Why, why did you want to become a teacher? Yeah. I mean, I think that there was definitely a little bit of that, um, sort of knocking around my head when I was, you know, 22, um, 23 years old. Uh, you know, and I mean, to be perfectly honest, I, I, you know, I didn't have a real clear plan for what I wanted to do with my life. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of those questions were still very, very kind of foggy in my head. Um, But in my, I think it was in my like maybe late junior year, but certainly into my senior year of college, I began to read a lot of sort of like educational philosophy texts. um, And that quickly got me into reading, you know, people like, uh, you know, Jonathan Kozel, who writes Mm -hmm. extensively about sort of American public schooling and and all the varieties of ways in which it sort of fails our kids. Um, Mm -hmm. And that that sort of both provoked, I think, a, a kind of an outrage um, and also sort of, I don't, I don't know, I mean, a motivation um, mm. to sort of plug into that world. And, and the way I was thinking about it, at least initially, was I would do it for a couple of years yeah. um, while I sort of figured out sort of who I was and what I wanted to do, and that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, and so when I got back to New York, I mean, I immediately went down to the, you know, the old Board of Ed, you know, did the fingerprinting thing and, and sort of signed up. And at that point in time, like they, they effectively sort of cast you out and you had to just sort of find a job. Mm -hmm. Um, And they had a room, if I'm remembering correctly, with just like job postings, you know, and it was up to you to kind of follow up and, and kind of secure yourself, you know, a position someplace. And so I was kind of in the middle of doing that. And, and as that was going on, they introduced this New York City Teaching Fellows program, uh, which is yeah. still very much alive and, and, and operating. Um, and so, you know, a friend of mine sort of suggested that I look into it, and I did, and I applied, went through the interview process. Um, and within, it was really quick at those, uh, in those days, within a couple of days, they turned around and sort of offered me a position, which was surprising because at the time, the, the, the program was very much kind of, uh, not not anti Teach for America, but but sort of the inverse. It was looking to recruit people that had already spent you know mm, a career yeah. in a different sector that were looking to I don't know move into into teaching or move into something else. Um, and so there was very much the sense that it wasn't a program that was designed um, for young people. Um, but mm. I, I think probably because they didn't get as many of the applications that they were expecting, they, they sort of had to take a bunch of young people. And so when I got into my cohort, which is the, the very first one, it was kind of a mix of, of young people sort of fresh out of college, or a couple of years out of college. And then there were a bunch of people that were making that sort of mid career transition right, right. from one thing to another. Um, you know, and it, and it, and then I ended up there, you know, doing that for a number of years. Did you get a choice, um, of, of what age students you were going to teach? Not really. I mean, the way, the way it worked, I mean, it, it was, it was a very, at that, at that point they were sort of, sort of making it up, I think, as they were going along, everything was kind of, you know, by the seat of everybody's pants. And so what they had done was they had, they'd sort of given us placements in schools. And so I was originally placed in a middle school um, in the South Bronx area. Mm. Um, and, and so that was what I was fully sort of anticipating doing. But as part of the kind of the boot camp that they, they put you into over the summer before the, the fall academic year begins, um, I had been doing sort of like observation and teacher training at another school in the South Bronx, which was an elementary school. 
And so I was there quite a bit and I, you know, I formed relationships with, you know, teachers and, and the administration. Um, and then at some point the principal sort of offered me a job, um, Mm. and said that she would help me take care of all of the, the sort of the paperwork that would allow me to sort of go from one school to another, which is, and I decided, you know, I felt comfortable. Um, it was, you know, there were petty little concerns, like it was easier to get to, um, you know, and, and, and you know, those things do matter actually. And so I, 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 took it on and, and just stayed. And so, so this there. is an elementary school in the Bronx. Yeah. It's an elementary school in the Bronx. God, what a um, population. Yeah. It was a really, uh, you know, I loved it. I, yeah. you know, the, the school itself, um, uh, which probably should remain nameless was, was a, um, it was a school that at the point at that time was, was known as a SIR school, which was school under registration review. So effectively what that meant was the state was, sort of thinking about closing it down. And in fact, the school mm. no longer exists wow. um, for, you know, any variety of different reasons, but, you know, and, and, and so it was a, it was a, um, yeah, it was a really extraordinary experience uh, in both positive and negative ways. I'm sure. Um, and like, and, and, and uh, I mean, I would imagine, and I'm just guessing here, mm-hmm. um, but it, it sounds like you brought a little bit of politics with you before you got there. Oh yeah. You had that, you had, yeah. And, and yeah. it seems like, I mean, if if you aren't radical before working at an elementary school in the Bronx that's being threatened with closure by the state, then you will be afterwards. You, yeah, I think yeah. That that's right. I mean, you, you, yeah, what's what's fascinating is, right, you see these young people kind of going into this situation or into these environments. And you basically have one of two choices. You can you become radicalized um, and, and you sort of commit yourself to pushing against all of the things that that are outrageous mm-hmm. um or you can kind of buy into the system and and yeah. and there are a lot of reasons why people choose to do that it's sure. easier you move up um you make more money uh you you generally have an easier time of it um well that's what i mean that's what's so hard about moving forward as a society at all right, right? Yeah, it's exactly just kind of right. that idea that like well we it, it's so, it's some often easier uh and easier to kind of like override that moral choice and yeah. kind of like well i need to feed my kids and That's get right. sure make sure that they go to good schools etc mm-hmm. um and that kind of self-preservation thing is just a uh, god keeps us keeps us from moving forward a lot i think um i mean where did your politics come from when you were as as a young person it sounds like you had you had a sense of moral outrage a lot of people <laughs> don't have that yeah. i wish more people did uh but but where did that come from yeah, I've I've thought about this a lot. And I'm I'm not entirely sure. I mean, there, there are some there are some sort of like signpost sort of moments I think in my my personal trajectory that that are definitely moments that informed my political sense. Um, some of them are, are, are clear. Some of them are a little bit less so. Um, but I think you know, I mean, growing up on the Lower East Side of Manhattan uh, yeah, during the 1980s yeah. uh, was um, in the 80s yeah yeah so back in the back in the days before it was you know the chicest neighborhood uh new york city there was a, what there was, was a it moment. i mean i have stereotypes yeah. in my head and i have movies in my head right. of, it, of like you know i think of like after hours or something yeah, yeah, yeah. you know and like that yeah. kind of stuff i mean it was it was it was great and, you know and i want to guard against sort of you know sort of being too nostalgic yeah, about it. Uh-huh. I mean, there there were there were a ton of ugly things going on in that mm-hmm. neighborhood. I mean, this was the period when you know HIV and AIDS and the crack epidemic were just in full blossom. Um, and you're like and, really young, so you and I was really this. young. So it's like yeah, a exactly. different perspective, for right, sure. You know, and 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 you know, Marshall Berman, who who used to teach at City College, who's who's now dead, mm-hmm. sort of talks about this tension, right, between sort of embracing the parts of it that were that that were wonderful and that were productive um and and the and then being sort of aware of and and remembering to acknowledge the fact that there there were a lot of bad things um, yeah. that were going on at the exact same time and i i think that that's i think that that's very much true about the the lower east side the the east village area um i mean that was you know the heyday of cbgb's yeah uh, yeah the bowery and um and but it was also yeah it was also a period where um, a lot of people were getting sick. A lot of mm. people were were dying. Drugs were were a constant uh, presence, um, mm. you know, explicitly out in the open. Um, crack houses were a thing. Yeah. Um, and yet, you know, I mean, I, I wouldn't have wanted to grow up anywhere else. <laughs> um, and and I definitely, I mean, I, I I I'm a little bit apprehensive about saying these sorts of things, but I I 
prefer that to sort of what it's become. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's and, it's we've talked about that a lot on the yeah. show. They kind of like I don't know the the double edged sword or whatever right, of gentrification right. and and how much it's changed down there. I don't like to be the person that's like, oh, it was better before right, when we yeah, had exactly. junkies here, right, and, right. you know, <laughs> and uh, now we have you know twenty dollar craft cocktails and. Right. It'd be nice to have like kind of a mix of both those yeah, things that's, or that's a balance exactly between right. them. Yeah. Um, but you know, uh, what, what about your parents? Are your parents? Uh, did you? Did, were there politics there from your parents? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, I mean, this is this is sort of it. I, you know, my my uh, my dad, who's now dead, um, was mo- both my parents were and are artists, um, mm. so, but neither of them were able to really support themselves doing that sort of solely. So my dad was a truck driver um, for. A number of years and my mom worked a number of different jobs and, and was home with me quite a bit as well um but uh but they were pretty politically active and and you know big sort of part of my early years um was or you know the way i remember it a lot of my memories were very much around sort of and i would argue like more my mom than my dad um sort of her political activism her sort of engagement and on a variety of different fronts i mean my mom was you know, she was involved with the Parents Association. I believe she was president at least once of the the PS19 Parents Association. Uh, but she was also one of two or three of the main kind of uh, community activists uh, that pushed against. Uh, at, at that time, there was a big uh, uh, push to open up a men's shelter right on the corner of the block that I grew up on. And there was a huge abandoned building, um, which is now uh sort of a building that's that's designed for sort of low and middle income people mm. um but they were going to make a men's shelter out of it there was already one down the block um and you know and the community just didn't want it um and and this went on for years um at the time and my mom was i mean obsessed with it at the at the yeah. moment and and that was something i mean still i have vivid memories of going to you know community hearings and and spending time with her she was doing the work of just organizing people um to sort of push back against the city government um which they won uh, yeah. at the end of the day um and, and you know for in a lot of ways that was instructive um mm-hmm. and inspiring uh and something that just kind of was baked into my day-to-day experience of living at home um and my dad too i mean to a lesser degree you know uh um, largely because, you know, for a while he, he just wasn't there very much because he was on the road driving mm. back and forth across the country. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Like a long distance truck driver. Oh, yeah. When you said yeah. truck driver, I was like, okay, local deliveries, no, and no, that no, kind no. of thing. No, like the first five years of my life, a, a lot of it um, was spent in a truck with my mom and my dad wow. just kind of going, going back and forth. Um, and, but I'm just you know, imagining when, uh, Big Trouble in Little China. Right. And, and <laughs> that, I'm sorry. That's the image that pops in my head of like the 80s and the truck um, and truck driving music. And uh, mm-hmm. it's like, quite, God, you've, you've got a mix of a lot of cultures going on. Yeah, absolutely. And what mm-hmm. about like ideology, though? I mean, your mom mm-hmm. sounds like she's a local activist. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I, I mean, I've seen that movie a couple of times, of like how to survive a plague that kind yeah. of like shows like how robust the local scene was during oh, this okay. era, um, a- active about AIDS, active about a lot of different things. But yeah. Was she like an ideological leftist or is she someone who was just kind of like more engaged in local activism and didn't think about that, that I, stuff? I mean, yeah, I don't know. I, uh, it's hard, I mean, to, I don't, it's hard yeah. to parse, I guess. I right? wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't say that she was. Did you was, have Marx books around the house? Not so much. I, you know, I, I would say I would say my mom's politics have <laughs> she's probably going to listen to this at some point but I, I would argue <laughs> that she's like she's moved uh, pretty pretty firmly more to the left over time mm. um, which is something that I, I, I think is really interesting but yeah no I think it was usually more it's the other way of, when people get in as they yeah, get older yeah, yeah. yeah exactly and I, I think you know the last you know 15 years have, have, have done a lot of work to push her in that direction huh. um, but uh, and, and, and certainly around around the Bush administration. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, like, I think the orientation was broadly liberal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, to the extent that like the ideology played into it, I mean, you know, from a very, very early age, I, you know, it was very clear to me, like my dad, my, my dad's two sort of like mythical enemies were Nixon and Reagan. Huh. Um, and, yeah. and that was something that, that came up quite a bit. Um, and, and so to that extent, I mean, yeah, definitely on the left, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it with a big L necessarily. Right. Um, right. Logically. But, um, but yeah, it seemed much more sort of community driven, sort of problem driven, um, you know, again, like, you know, school, school based activism, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. you know, street based activism, uh, you know, the, the neighborhood community, uh, associations, that kind of thing, the block association. Um, and that, that was, I think really the bread and butter of, of, 
my parents' politics to the extent that they were able to sort of engage and and, and participate. Um, and that's where you can win meaningful victories precisely. and like really feel the politics. Yeah, and that was the big takeaway yeah. for me at least was like, yeah, if you get people together um, and you get them organized and on the same page, um, yeah, a lot can get done. Uh-huh, and uh, I mean... You, you, I, also, I mean, I associate with, and we can get to. I want to get to to warscapes because I, mm-hmm. I, I think about that a, a, a lot with you. But, but I, I think I think of you too as someone who is very concerned with war and mm-hmm. war as a topic of inquiry mm-hmm. and war as a as a a, a phenomenon that needs confrontation mm-hmm. in our in our lifetime. But it, it's 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 kind of war is such a huge topic. Yeah. War is not something that you go down to your community board and kind of organize a few people around and get something done. Right. Although maybe it is. Um, yeah. But I mean, how did you get, how did you get into the idea of international relations and like global politics and right. that kind of stuff? Cause that's, that's what I, I think, I think about you a lot with that. Yeah, stuff. that's a great question. I, I, you know, I, I don't quite know, to be honest. I mean, there was, I, I, I'll sort of give you the, the timeline. I think maybe that'll yeah. kind of flesh some of it out, but yeah, I, you know, it was, it's true that I went in, you know, when I was teaching, um, that was really the thing that, that, uh, I was focused on. I mean, obviously nine 11, um, yeah, sort yeah. of, you know, recalibrated, uh, a lot of the way in which I was thinking and, and what I was thinking about. So can um, we go to that? Can we sit, sit on that yeah, for a second? Sure, Cause I absolutely. love nine 11 as a topic yeah. of like changing people's politics and kind of waking people up. Cause that, yeah. that's what happened to me too. But, um, I think part of it is also like that, that kind of his, uh, mythologizing. I'm, I'm, right. I'm kind of like making the history sure. now, like this is what yeah. happened. <laughs> but like, um, where were you? Were you teaching in the Bronx or when that happened? Yeah. Okay. So it was, yeah, I was, I was teaching, um, and it happened, uh, and there was just, you know, I mean, just like everywhere else, you know, these stories, everybody's got one, I guess. But, um, you know, at first there was confusion, then there was just, just terror, yeah. you know, and, and people completely freaking out. Uh, school was closed. Um, you know, all of the parents were called and people were just coming and rushing and, and getting their kids. And at the time, um, I was uh, I was commuting back and forth uh, with a friend um, who was also from the Lower East Side who was teaching at the school. And, and so we would drive every day together um, into school. And so she and I sort of got ourselves together. We drove as far south, I guess, as possible. Um, drove to the Bronx, Manhattan's border, but they were they were effectively sealing off the the island, yeah. right? And so we had to park the car, um, and then we walked from I think it was like a hundred the Willis Avenue bridge, I think it was, and then we basically walked from 130 something Street all the way back downtown, and it was you know it was it was scary and exhausting. Um, mm. and you know, I just remember walking down, I think it was first Avenue, you know, there, there are the hospitals that, that yeah, yeah. line that and, you know, and, and people were coming up to those hospitals and, and pretty much immediately I, my history may be, you know, wrong on this, but I, but I remember that there were people looking to give blood already like yeah, immediately. Yeah. And, um, and it was just, you know, and you sort of like walked in a daze, you know, a lot of ways and, and, finally get back downtown and and for a number of days you know sort of all of southern manhattan was on lockdown you know, remember that you couldn't get in or out of i think beyond 14th street union square that area um and the smell you know yeah. just was yeah. which i think a lot of people remember and um which was just awful and sickening um and yeah and just the like the terror and the outrage i mean i just people didn't know what to do with themselves and and you know and and like I, I, yeah. So there was that, and then there was the kind of the reaction to that, right? right? Yeah, um, and seeing which, that. I mean, I think back now, like Giuliani, yeah. this ghoul, yeah, right, this guy that, um, you know, I still consider just probably one of the most loathsome creatures Without to doubt. ever yeah. be in American politics, is the mayor of New York yeah. at this moment, yeah. right? And 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 George W. Bush comes in and has a megaphone and says, "They're all going to hear us soon." I thought. I, I mean, did you feel war was coming at that oh, yeah, moment? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it was. You know, I mean, remember, like there were, there were. It wasn't just like that this thing had happened, but that there were going to be, you know, nuclear bombs going mm-hmm, off, like right. the suitcase bomb scare, and oh, the anthrax the, thing, yeah, yeah and all there was that. Yeah, that. there was uh-huh. the guy in Chicago who was like supposedly. I think he was like a Dominican guy who had converted to Islam or something. I, I don't remember the details, but he had like a plan to blow up a public housing. I mean, there were mm-hmm, all of these mm-hmm. stories circulating. The sniper was happening, the right. uh, Maryland sniper yeah, thing. It just yeah. seemed like, you know, just like anything could happen, but it seemed like people were primed for retaliation. Um, I do remember having a lot of conversations with people about this question of like, what do you do next? Um, and, you know, and then very quickly for within a year and a half or whatever it was, you know, we had, we'd gone from invading one country to invading a second country, um, you know, and the, the, the switch from Afghanistan to Iraq and 
that whole thing. And, and, you know, and in that period, I, you know, I was obsessed. I was, I was, I was realizing how little I actually knew yeah. about the places yeah. that we were yeah, yeah. going and just trying to get my hands on. I felt exactly I could, the same you know? way. I felt like, it, I mean, it, how old were you if, it, when nine eleven happened? 24. Yeah. 24. Yeah. yeah. I, I was 23. So yeah. it, and it was, you know, I was out of college trying yep. to figure out what to, next to do with my life. Yep. And, and really, at, at, yeah, at that moment, you're really in your own life. Mm-hmm. You're really kind of in your own, mm-hmm. what am I going to do? And when right. 9-11 happened, it brought me out of myself, made me realize that there were all these countries that I had kind of heard in the background right. of my la- whole life. Yeah. And, it, and it gave me the same desire to be like, I need to know what these places are and right. what and how the United States, how this happened. Yeah. I mean, it was just kind of like, I felt completely out of it, out of the loop. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's funny too, because like I, I spent... A lot of my college years, really, really hating Bill Clinton, um, and, <laughs> and looking back on it, I, like I'm not really sure. Like I definitely, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure at some point in there, I had read the the Hitchens book about Bill Clinton, um, and, that, yeah, and that was yeah. a that was a thing. But also just like reading Chomsky and sort of, mm-hmm. and I was aware of a lot of the like I was I was I was sort of intellectually aware that there were a lot of things going on in American foreign yeah, policy yeah. were ugly and you know the Clinton you know rocketing Sudan trying to kill Osama bin Laden and I had seen Michael Moore things. films already exactly yeah, you know, and, right. but, it, but 9-11 really made it clear to me that yes. like that both one that I was like immature relatively speaking and two like I, I just had sort of a uh, a surface kind of understanding of what was actually going on mm. and, and um and not a particularly informed one and and so yeah, it just completely I reoriented sort of my interest sets in a lot of ways, um, and and sort of how I was thinking about things, and um, and what I what it was that I wanted to sort of do, I, I guess, sort of intellectually, if that's if that's the appropriate way of thinking about it, um, and and definitely made a pivot to that. I, I will say though, at this exact same time, you know, I was teaching elementary school, um, and kind of you know it overwhelmed in a lot of ways by that experience, mm-hmm. um, and realizing that. You know, I, I cared very deeply about it. Um, I enjoyed the teaching. I hated the the, the school politics, um, and that was really sort of wearing me down. And and you know, I walked out of there after five years, just completely worn out. Um, yeah, and, yeah. And kind of feeling kind of hopeless about things, um, and and feeling just sort of tired. Um, and all of that put together. I mean, one day I just I just quit. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, and yeah, and I, I had, I, I mean, it wasn't like a spontaneous sort of thing. I didn't really have a plan, but I was saving up money and I was, I was trying to figure out sort of what my next steps were going to be. Um, and so, yeah, so I, I put in my letter of res- resignation, um, and then I got a, a one way plane ticket down to Central America. Um, and then for the better part of a year, I guess it was. Um, yeah, I, I kicked around Latin America, um, and sort why of, there? And, uh, yeah, I, you know, it, uh, a bunch of, I mean, I had, I had spent a little bit of time down there, um, previously, um, and I had, I had spent some time, um, in El Salvador, uh, sort of kicking around there with a friend, um, and I loved it, you know, and I, I felt really comfortable. Um, I also, I had, I'd been also doing just a lot of reading, and I don't quite know why, but I'd been doing a lot of reading into Latin American history, probably mm. again through through sort of Chomsky's focus on that. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that really sort of inspired, you know, a lot of interest specifically around Salvador and, and around Nicaragua. Mm. Um, and so so there was that motivation. Um, it was cheap. Um, yeah. So I could yeah. I could kind of get a lot done, see a lot of things. You speak Spanish? Um, and to learn Spanish. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. To really like I, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood that was predominantly Latino. And, and so it was always sort of there, um, sort of in the in the, the, the mix. Um, and you hear a lot of sort of Spanglish. And, and uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, but I didn't really have any facility with the language. And so I thought I should probably clean that up, um, try to get a little bit of a, a, a sort of more competency in that in that basic respect um yeah and i did that and while i was down there i was sort of you know trying to figure out uh, at that point i think i decided largely because of sort of like what was going on politically and otherwise that that international politics um and, and culture was really the thing that that got me going the thing that mm. i that i spent a lot of time thinking about the thing that i thought you know i'd ultimately be able to sort of make a contribution to, um, academically perhaps, or, or maybe intellectually. And so, yeah, so I, I applied to schools, um, and, uh, applied to the grad center. And this um, is the, so you're doing all this, um, traveling in Latin America during the Bush years. Oh yeah. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Wow. Um, and it was remarkable. And I, and I had been doing, you know, I will say, I mean, the, one of the great sort of luxuries about being a New York city public school teacher is you get a lot of time off. Um, 
and you know you get like the spring break the winter break uh yes you get like the february break you get you're not you know, telling three, me anything here yeah three months <laughs> off in the summer and and the wonderful thing about being like a young person um who's single and no kids um and and doing this type of work is you can you can travel a lot yeah. and so i had yeah. been doing quite a bit of travel. like every time we had a break i just got the hell out of here um and went someplace and so i was sort of I was becoming sort of aware of of a variety of different places around the world, um, but Latin America was the thing that I always Latin America and the Middle East were the really the places I kept coming back to. Um, and those are both reading. sites that have just such a profound relationship with the, the, United, the United States, States shaping exactly. their, their 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 political situations. That's right. And yeah, I mean, and and that 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 was the entryway for me too. I mean, a lot of this stuff. I, I remember I bought a poster and I had it on my wall for a long time from this. I don't know, they're like some anarchist collective up north somewhere. I think they're in Massachusetts or something called the Beehive Collective. I don't know if you ever heard of these people. I don't think so, no. But they used to like they used to show up at like different like anti war protests and stuff okay. and sell their wares. And mm-hmm. they had this poster uh that was like a a drawing, like a, one of those like Where's Waldo type mm-hmm. panoramas, which is a million things going on, and it's called Plan Columbia, mm-hmm. and it was literally about kind of like it was an education, it was like a visual education of like American policy towards Colombia, right. um, and it had a lot to do with Monsanto and Coca Cola and mm-hmm. you know corporations controlling the situation there, and, it, and for me. It was just like, I didn't even know, my, I love this poster, and I felt like this poster was a symbol of my politics in some way, in just the sense that I knew, I knew and was disgusted by the idea of like how much American power flexed its muscles around the world to, yeah. to really kind of exploit, not, not really kind of, but yeah. literally imperialize the world, and, 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 and that, that seems like an interest for you because it's the Middle East and, and, and Latin America. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and, and I, all of that. Yeah, exactly. My, was pretty much sort of my experience too, was like you, you, you start reading and then you actually start visiting places and you start really seeing the direct influence, the direct control and, and kind of the, the detritus, I think of, mm, of mm-hmm. sort of empire in withdrawal or, or decline or whatever you want to call it. I mean, there, there is a sense that American power, I think plays out pretty differently in different Latin American countries. Yeah, and, and right. Generally speaking, I guess that's true around the world. Um, and, and, and that presence or lack thereof really, I think to a great degree shapes sort of what's going on. And so, mm-hmm. I mean, you, yeah, you go to a country like Colombia where I've spent a good deal of time, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, mm-hmm. and you really see American influence, mm-hmm, um, and, mm-hmm. and it's still there. Um, and it's, it's ever present. Um, and as against, you know, some of the countries of, of Central America, for yeah. example, yeah, yeah. where it feels like for all intents and purposes, you know, people have lost interest. Um, mm. And so like Salvador would be a great example of this, I think, in a lot of ways where you see sort of the, the you know, especially when you get out into the rural areas, you really see kind of the, the gutting of rural life by, you know, the forces of globalization and all yeah. these things, people just leaving, you know, young men specifically leaving and, and not leaving and, and not much is left behind as a result um, it seems like, and so absolutely, it's a, it's it's an education for sure. And and while I was down there, I got really, int- I'm less, I'm, I think ultimately, I'm less interested in kind of the the, the standard issue foreign policy relationships mm-hmm. between the United States and other countries, um, although it's fascinating. But I'm really sort of interested in in the degree to which kind of market forces yeah. kind of give life to social and political relationships, mm. um, and that's something that's that. I think if you do a l- little bit of digging, you'll start to uncover um, in places like, you know, Colombia, for example. And I'm, I'm over when I was there and, and even previous to that in, in Salvador. I mean, the, the the thing that I was really introduced to was the the prevalence and presence of organized crime. And in mm. Salvador, it's the gangs and in Colombia, it's it's obviously sort of the history of trafficking um, and, and traffickers, and which is still very much a thing. And and you really begin to see just how embedded it all is, you know, and, and sort of... And how the, that organized crime interacts with the larger kind of market forces you're talking about. The market forces yeah. and the government, you know, yeah, and, that's, yeah, yeah. and that's the thing. Ultimately, that's the thing I, I came to want to study um, sort of academically. It's kind of interesting because it's like the force... You, you, you can put it a lot of different ways. You put it as like the forces of globalization. You know, I, I've... I've spent a lot of time thinking about it in terms of like, you know, oil and access mm-hmm. to resources. And it seems like even with this like standing rock thing that happened recently and it's still unfolding in, in the Dakotas, it's like the idea is, is, you know, those rural fringes are the ones where a lot of those resources are being mined out. And that's mm-hmm. where those people are being displaced. I mean, like yeah. in a lot of, in a lot of ways, those places that, you know, uh, uh, tend to be forgotten by people yeah. in other, in other areas of the country or world are, are places where they're really the front lines of, of, of this, uh, 
really, really kind of like, I don't know, it's almost like the le- squeezing the last drops out of the earth to get these yeah. last, because uh, I mean, it's, it's hydrofracking up in the Dakotas, yeah, right? It's exactly like, right. Yeah. Um, rather than kind of like find a way to disrupt our dependence on oil, mm-hmm. it's like we're going to continue to profit off of this yeah. and we're going to continue to like run our society this way. It's just, um, uh, I don't know if you feel that you feel that in places that the places that you've spent a lot of time, it seems like. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and it's not just oil. I mean, again, you know, El Salvador is an interesting case. There was just um, I guess it was now a couple of weeks ago, um, a really a, a nice uh, 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 development there, um, which was that there was this there was this World Bank court sort mm. of secret court mm-hmm. case uh, that had been going on for, I mean, like seven years, eight years, something along those lines. Um and and basically all of it centered around this little sort of Canadian multinational mining firm hmm. um, that was exploring for gold in, in El Salvador, um, and and was looking to 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 extract it. Um, and was looking to sort of take it out of the ground. And and what what happened was there was a lot of uh, sort of a public push in Salvador as well as you know uh, by and, and and league with a lot of activists in the United States and other countries pushing against this from happening because. The, the issue really was that when you when you try to take gold out of the ground and the way in which it was being doing it, they were doing it you you effectively pollute the soil um, with arsenic and other chemicals that f- quickly find their way into the water um, and in this particular region of the country it was where the water basin was and so there were real environmental concerns the company wasn't able to demonstrate that the what they were looking to do wouldn't just completely sort of destroy the environment. Um, and so for these reasons and others, the, the government uh, effectively took away its right to continue to, to mine for gold. Mm. Um, and then they sued the Salvadoran government, the Canadian firm, which is no longer Canadian. It, it's been sold off and merged. And I don't even understand uh, exactly what's, what's going on in the corporate level. It's now, I think, owned by an Australian company. Ah. Um, but they effectively used CAFTA, which is sort of the Central American version of NAFTA, uh, to bring this suit against Salvador, even though uh, Canada wasn't a, a, a member or a participating state, wow. they'd opened up an office, I think, in California, and then used that as a way to, as a mechanism through which they could, they could bring this lawsuit. Um, and it just, and it, this went on and on and on, and and it was of big concern, sort of most recently, to a lot of people because effectively what was happening was what a lot of people were worried about happening with the TPP, mm, um, right? This ability for corporations to kind of just like you know sue at will. Um, and especially weak states, right? And, and the amounts of money that they were seeking from the Salvadoran government were beyond the capacity of the government to, to ultimately come up with should they lose. And so lots of worry. And, and, and then you start thinking about gold in this country, and it's not even clear there is any or much. Um, it's, it's not clear that this was even something that, wow. that would make sense from an economic point of view. And so that brings up these other questions, like what's actually going on here? Yeah. You know, what, yeah. are the, what are the interests? What are the, yeah, what... what why um and thankfully that, that it seems like at least for the moment the door has been sort of shut on that but it, again a great instance it's not just these kind of like these things that we spend a lot of time focusing on like oil and, and energy mm, concerns yeah little but, things you know, uh, well, minerals and, and, and yeah conflict minerals right and exactly. like i mean the idea of like uh our our, our, our precious technology yeah. is, is kind of you know dependent upon getting minerals and resources from from areas that we have to do really ugly shit to get them and, yeah. and, and enter into relationships with really ugly people. I mean, isn't like, uh, I mean, it sounds like kind of a bumper sticker, but what you're describing is kind of like corporations are organized crime. Yeah. Right. I mean, in some, yeah. in some ways they, they're, they're functioning in similar, in similar kind of yeah. frameworks. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, when I, when I teach this to students, I, 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 I make the claim, I think it's not completely wrong. Um, and that is that, you know, when you look at organized crime and you look at sort of how multinationals, organize themselves are very very i mean they're they're almost identical right in the way in which they sort of sh- set up their their chain of production the way in which they think about how yeah. it is that they're going to organize their resources the way in which they they lobby and and sort of interact with government um you know the chief distinction really is you know one traffics in things that the state has legitimated um and and as referred to as legal and the other doesn't um, and the use of violence too yeah, right absolutely. i mean i thought the sopranos did a really great job of that i don't know if you saw the show i bring up the sopranos all the time on this yeah. show but like at the, during the end of the sopranos they kind of made a point of like you know they, they go down the two of the two of the like you know italian american gangsters uh, go to basically a starbucks to try to shake down the starbucks for protection money yeah. and the starbucks people are like well 
that doesn't work that way. And we have right. to talk to the corporate office and like our manager. And you, you kind of get this sense that like there's a new mob in town mm -hmm. and it's Starbucks. Right. And they're like much more efficient and actually like much more like ruthless in the way that mm -hmm. they're able to control um, huge, huge amounts of wealth and property and populations. Uh, it's really scary. I'm, so I, I want to get I want to make sure we get to uh, uh, well, there's an organized crime thing, which you're still yeah. uh, you're at the CUNY Graduate Center. Are you finishing? No, I'm finishing right okay. now. Okay, and so you've you've continued that that yep. track of working on organized crime. That's the idea. Yeah. But but uh, um, in in Latin America specifically, Latin yeah exactly yeah yeah Can uh, Colombia and Mexico are sort of the two the two cases that I spent time looking at. But you've also um, you also work as a uh, one of the senior senior editors of Warscapes, a publication yeah. that I think many people um, that listen to this show, if they haven't checked out, should should check out. I think it's at warscapes.com. You, right. yep. um, you can find you can find the publication there. But what I mean, when did how did Warscapes get started and, and how did you get involved with it? Yeah. Um, so it's been it's been a number of years, like four years now, uh, something along those lines. Um, it's it's the brainchild of, of Bhakti uh, mm -hmm. Shungarpur, who, you know, and yep. and. Her husband, uh, Michael Bronner, um, and, and initially there were some other folks that were sort of loosely, sort of uh, uh, affiliated with it, who were putting together this publication, um, and mm -hmm. it was really designed as a as a vehicle um, for, you know, for for introducing new voices, uh, largely from parts of the world that are that are ignored. I think yeah. uh, certainly in kind of the the anglophone sphere of, mm -hmm. of you know cultural production and, and political analysis and that kind of thing, um, and with a focus on those precisely those parts of the world, um, and and you know and to a great degree that continues to be sort of the 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 lodestone or sort of the motivation um, and the things that we're doing. Although we've 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 expanded out quite a bit, um, and yeah, initially it, it was really Bhakti's thing, and then shortly into I think launching it, I. I was one of the people that that submitted or, or, or contributed to the sort of the launch of the thing. So I mm -hmm. wrote, I think it was like a book review or something. Um, and you know, and she's another CUNY grad center person. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so there are all of these just quote, overlapping networks. Um, and so yeah, and so through that, pretty quickly, um, I came on board, uh, sort of in a more I guess official capacity um, as an editor, and I've been doing it sort of ever since. I mean, you know, my my initial kind of like bailiwick of like responsibility was to try to sort of beef up the the political analysis side of things mm, um, because mm -hmm. Bhakti is a, a a comparative lit person and right. so and she's got tons of, of folks um, sort of in her stable of, of of writers that she admires and calls on and other things um, and so she sort of did that um, and to and to a degree I did that but more I was focused on kind of just straight up political analysis um, and over time. I think these these categories have sort of blurred, um, yeah. and, and what we've been trying to do has has changed, um, and and you know changed because I think we're getting better at certain things. Yeah, um, yeah. changed because we realize that you 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 know you sort of have to do certain things in order to attract and sustain an audience and, and build it over time. Um, and so currently, yeah, we're we're a exclusively web based um, publication, but we are moving into print territory. Um, so that's the big Great. exciting news Great. for 2017. Um, and, and really kind of reorienting a lot of what we've done, um, which has been kind of a balance of, of kind of short, you know, uh, politically sort of driven um, pieces. So, you know, like a thousand words, 1500 words, whatever. Um, and, and, and reviews like, you know, film reviews, art reviews, book yeah. reviews, that kind of thing. Um, and a kind of like a, an emphasis on short stories. Um, mm -hmm. so we get a lot of authors, um, publishing, you know, their short fiction, um, largely from sub-Saharan African countries, um, but other places as well. Um, and we're, we're kind of moving into a more, uh, uh, explicitly sort of long read format. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. that's the goal, um, is, is to really, emphasize uh yeah long form writing. it's kind of interesting because um, it's like almost the, it's it's it, and i see this happening in the publishing industry and in in mm -hmm. media and journalism kind of going back and revert because like it, yeah. it was like for a long time you know all only print obviously yeah. internet came and better get take that print stuff and put it all online because that's yep. all, all it's going to work and now there's this impulse to kind of like go back to print yep. go back to long form get away from buzzfeedy bullshit articles yeah. that are that you know that are just a paragraph long and really meant for the for the for the clickbait headline and yep. um there is a desire and i hope there is and i hope there is a, a a desire among readers to kind of like recapture that 
I don't know that that kind that, that, that longer interrogation, deeper interrogation of these issues. Um, not, so not, yeah, that's he, great. Yeah, I'm not even clear it went away. I yeah, mean, you know, it's You're right. I think it's I think it's been there. I think it's just been. I think our sort of consumptive environment, yes. you know, if that's, has been polluted yeah. with all of this kind of like the the BuzzFeed things and the listicles and all of these. You know, um, and everybody is a pundit, and everybody's sure. got you know sort of their 500 word take on something. Um, but there has been this kind of static. I would argue robust long form production mm. that's been going mm-hmm. on. And, you know, I was at a, I was at, actually at a CUNY grad center event. This must've been like four years ago. Um, and it was a panel discussion um, on the future of long form. Um, and so there were, I think there was somebody from like the New Yorker there and somebody from the Atlantic. And I think it was the editor of the atavist. Um, I don't know if you've come across Mm-mm, that, no. but that's a, like a, that's a four uh, sort of, or they, they produce really, really excellent long form work, yeah. um, but they, they, they make you pay for it. Yeah. Um, and, and so part of it was sort of talking through the, the business model of what this was. And I think it was in that part of the discussion that editor sort of said, you know, the thing is, is that we're, everybody is going to snap back to this long form uh, posture. Um, and it may not be next year, it may not be five years, but it's going to happen. And his argument was, and I thought I found it persuasive and I think it's true, is that there is, there, there is an audience for long form. Um, yeah. And what you have to kind of figure out is sort of like who's loyal to your publication um, who wants to consume the things that your publication mm. is actually producing, um, and then and then kind of figuring out whether or not they're going to be willing to pay for it. Um, yeah. and, and he was arguing that this is what the New Yorker kind of figured out, was that they just <laughs> knew that they had a base that they could depend on, kind of financially, um, but just generally speaking, um, and didn't have to play. Harper's was another good example of mm-hmm, this. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't have to play the, the short form game. Right. Um, they were sort of, you know, and, and to a degree, I, you know, they do, but... But they, but in a bigger sense, they don't. And you know, if you look at the Harper's website, I mean, it's, it hasn't changed much since like, yeah, the internet know. was invented, you know, and, and they really do continue to rely, you know, heavily on their print. Um, and, and it feels like that's now beginning to happen. I mean, you look at like Jacobin, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and they just have this loyal and growing base. That, yeah. And that, things look good. I mean, I, and, and I mean, Warscapes, yeah, right. go to warscapes.com, uh, because the, it looks awesome. Oh, it, it's, 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 yeah. it's a really great looking site. And, and the material that's on it is, I feel like, you know, maybe we can talk for a second about like war and media because sure. there's this idea, you know, I, I study the Vietnam war and, and, you know, there's this kind of like cultural idea that the Vietnam war was unpopular because the, the media kind of told Americans the wrong story and made them turn against the war, which is, mm-hmm. um, I mean, a pretty, pretty well debunked idea right. within, within the scholarship that, that actually the, the media, particularly television media and <clears throat> mainstream print media, like the Washington Post and New York times, they were just 100% cheerleaders for the administrations. And in fact, helped the administration bury all sorts of awful secrets about the Vietnam war. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're still in that environment, right? Yeah. We're still, I mean, is that part of what Warscapes do you see intervening on that landscape of like intense propaganda from whatever we call the mainstream media? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, I, I think we've definitely, we've definitely gone down that road. Um, I think, I think I would argue that we're, we're beginning to retreat a little bit from mm. that work um, mm-hmm. sort of directly because that also lends itself to kind of the hot take, right? Like every yeah. time Tom Friedman writes a column, you can, you can write a column that attacks it. It's not the, right. the hardest right. thing in the world. Um, and there are these kind of larger critiques, I think, that are really valuable and, and that are that are ongoing. Um, but more, I think you're absolutely right. And the, the thing, you know, one of the observations that we make is that, you know, part of the, the, the media sort of, uh, yeah, media examinations of war um, broadly conceived often serve the purpose of whether consciously or not kind of erasing the people that are actually suffering um, yeah, from yeah. from those wars, the people that are the objects of sure. of that war, um, and so to the degree that we're intervening, we're trying to we're trying to to give voice to that um, mm. and and really offer a platform for people um, who who live in these environments, who are experts um, in in these environments, kind of tell their story, whether that's you know an actual short story um, or whether that is a long form you know piece of political analysis and reporting. Um, you know, we've done a little bit of both. And I, I think to the degree that we're able to do that, we're going to, I think, move more firmly in that direction sort of over time. And that was really the original intent. Yeah. I mean, it, it goes with the title, right? Yeah. It's kind of like Warscapes is kind of like understanding the actual kind of on the ground stuff. Yeah. And it has a very international perspective, the publication, right. which I think is is probably the most kind of unique hallmark of it yeah. is, is that that perspective. Um 
Yeah, that the Warscapes has been I I think is a is a, a unique publication in mm-hmm. in what it's in what it's doing. I just oh, so I just got uh, I mean, I, would you consider Warscapes and I mean in terms of its politics, would you consider it a, a, an an anti-war publication? That's interesting. Um I say that because yeah. I, I I just finished teaching a course yeah. called Anti-War Activism Since the Vietnam Era. And me and my students spent the whole semester kind of considering this topic of like how have people resisted war throughout uh, uh, particularly the last you know 50 60 years of american history mm-hmm. um how, how have americans themselves resisted war it was kind of like focusing on on this country yeah. but it was oftentimes we just kind of like you know we came to we we often came to this kind of sense of like well what is anti-war activism right it, you know it right. almost felt like at times we'd get close to understanding what this is and then it mm-hmm. fell apart but i mean at, at warscapes is that an anti-war is that an act of yeah i feel i mean of I feel anti-war war, activism that's i i uh, i want to <laughs> say yeah um although i i also i worry about this a lot um largely because i i because of the sort of the confusion that you've just put your finger on yeah. i think is I mean, the stuff that's going on right now around Aleppo, for example, I, yes, I yes. find hard to to understand, I mean, not understand, but kind of deal with, um, because it, I mean, I think there is an argument to be made that, that the, that the anti-war left, for example, mm-hmm. um, has, has produced a condition where like there aren't that many people even talking about it yeah um, yeah uh, you know and and then there are the fights and the skirmishes like on the left around sort of whether to intervene or not and, and to what extent and, yes and that stuff is just hard um yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and a lot of ugliness and on the left uh, and of accusations ugliness. of who's pro-assad and who's yeah, exactly. and, and like the, the bathist yeah. nonsense and all uh-huh. this stuff and i i and I have very little patience, really, uh, for that, or the, or really interest in, in engaging with it. Um, but yeah, I mean, to the to the extent that, to the extent that I think it's you know largely fair to say that that um, wars, you know, certainly in the modern age, is largely built around you know concerns of of economy and mm-hmm. and resources and and power um, and and the ways in which sort of imperialist power um, or sort of colonialist powers play into that. I, you know, yeah, I think we're anti-war um but when you know what that actually means on a case-by-case basis mm. i th- i don't know that we do a whole lot um to you know frankly to engage that particular debate um well and, it's a, i mean we we finished by reading you know, chris hedges you yeah know, uh, war is a force that gives us meaning which kind yeah. of you know there is that kind of there there are, there are the things you just mentioned which is like war as a structure and war as a war as a kind of like um political condition and, right. a, and a result of a lot of economic stuff uh, um, to put it to put it one way, but but there's also like the stuff that Chris Hedges talks about in that book is like something more troubling, mm-hmm. which is this kind of like human desire for war or what people get out of war um, that 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 is really troubling stuff and mm-hmm. really hard to confront about yeah. just kind of like what it's like to be a human being and why these things exist. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, and and uh, that that's great. Uh, I think I would argue that what we do at Warscapes is right provide a, a, a sort of a platform or a stage for precisely those types of interrogations. Yeah. You uh-huh. know, like thinking about, you know, sort of going back to like a lot of like the like love it or hate it, like the Susan Sontag stuff around yeah. sort of the imagery of yeah, war. Yeah. You know, and and really trying to figure out you know answers to these types of questions. I think is very much the 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 conversation of the debate that we're interested in having that we're interested in sort of provoking um less on the right on the the, the formal sort of policy side mm-hmm, um, although mm-hmm. I, th- I would argue that by and large we um we hold pretty firm positions um you know that that from a policy standpoint there's there's a lot of reason to to be apprehensive about the idea right of, of right war continuing them going to them going into them etc um but it's yeah it is those kind of philosophical questions yeah. that are the ones that are I think that are the most disturbing and the most troubling um, and the ones that need, you know, uh, the most attention, you know, so, uh, as we try to figure these things out and try to think through how it is that our motivations for the positions that we take on any given conflict or war generally um, sort of are shaped, right? And, and, yeah. and how they develop and how they're manipulated over time. Um, yeah, and it's, it's almost like your sto- the stories that are in Warscapes are meant to kind of show, not tell, in a sense, right. yeah. uh, uh, um, and kind of reveal... Because I mean, what was interesting to me about the Chris Hedges stuff is like it, basically he's he's arguing that that war is 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 a bad context for humans to be in because that context uh, allows elements of of humanity to, to come out that that aren't desirable, right? Mm-hmm. So like war, 
uh, war, war brings out the worst, basically, yeah. in people. And so, you know, whatever economic or political structure that causes that is something where we got to pay a lot of attention because that's, you know, going to be the magnet for all that ugliness. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, I was thinking about, you know, when I think about anti-war activism um, in America, you know, during the Bush years, we were you were you on the streets for any of that stuff? Did you go to any of those demonstrations? I mean, I remember I went to some of the bigger ones. Right, right. Um, and then, I mean, it was. I think I feel like a big part of my politics is formed by the fact that I saw millions of people on the streets in the during the Bush years, and then no one during the Obama years. Or a, a, a big yeah. drop, a big drop in anti-war activism, or at least uh, liberal squeamishness about war. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, was that something that you were watching during the Obama years too? Like during oh, like yeah. the, you know, the the whole kind of like, I don't know, liberal embrace of drone war and and all yeah. that stuff. I mean, oh, absolutely. I mean, I, yeah, and it's the, it's the thing that that you know. I mean, uh, we're, we're we're about to get slammed, right? I guess we're already in the middle of it, like of the the sort of the the postmortem on the Obama years. Yeah, you know? and I think I think right. we're in for that a lot more. And and again, you know, I mean, the the the, the I mean, the Trump thing um i think is only gonna sort of uh, force people to double down on their kind of embrace of of the obama years and and mm. kind of whitewash out um yeah the drone i mean the drone stuff is unconscionable um yeah. you know it's just as, i think it's as simple as that and and it's not something that we spend a lot of time with the, the degree to which that we you know sure like obama you know drew down troops in Iraq, um, Mm -hmm. seemingly in Afghanistan. Um, But those conflicts are alive and well. We're still very much there. Um, We're there directly and or indirectly. Um, We've expanded, you know, theater of operations into a variety of other countries. Um, And there's this weird thing that's gone on, right? Which is, you know, American politics is not something that that I claim to know a whole lot about, but it seems to me really that what Obama did, um, in part, you know, sort of to to shore up, you know, sort of political support and, and kind of fend off, I think, you know, the the worst of the Republicans, was to sort of embrace this idea of being of being a tough guy, um, and yeah. and doing it more thoroughly and more smartly, if that's a word, than the Bush administration was able to do, um, you know, and and on that front, you know, the 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 only Republicans that really seem to have a problem with it are like the far right libertarians, right? Yeah. The Rand Paul's of the world. But, and even their criticisms are, are wrapped up in all of these other sort of considerations and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I think it was amazing to me just how on all fronts, really like how um, all of the excitement and the, the organizing that was going on sort of leading up to Obama's first election, the first term mm-hmm, mm-hmm. kind of fell away. And it yeah. felt like people just decided like they had done their, th- I mean, you know, they, they had done their duty. Um, they had elected the first black president. Mm-hmm. Um, he was clearly smarter and more capable, uh, more likable than, than the person that, you know, preceded him. Um, and I think that that gave people uh, sort of the freedom to kind of disengage in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I, I would argue that that's that's true, you know, in any number of different policy areas, including sort of the foreign policy um, mm-hmm, sort mm-hmm. of realm of things. And um, yeah, there was, a, I mean, just a marked distinction between what went on during the Bush years, uh, where you're right. I mean, I, I remember just, you know, probably less as time went on, especially as the Bush administration sort of fell apart. Um, and, that's and right. That's right. Wasn't really capable or, or didn't have any mandate to do much of anything um, at the end. But in those early years, my God, I mean, you know, yeah. people, millions of people across the United States, you know, protesting the war in Iraq, um, it, you know, and, and some of the things that sort of came after that. And yeah, it was exciting, um, you know, in the moment. It, it felt like, um, I don't know, there was a, you know, you remember back to 2001 before 9-11. I mean, it really felt like people had been disarmed and, and I don't know if you remember his inauguration, but it was just, it yeah. was, it was very much like probably not as intense, but it was very much like, I feel like things feel right now, mm, um, which mm-hmm. is like bad things are coming. You're not really sure what they're going to be. Yep. Um, you'll remember like the early on in the Bush years, there was the, the American plane that crashed into the Chinese plane. I think it was, a, that's was, right. Yeah. 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 There was all mm-hmm. this like stuff and, and, and yet Bush's posture at that point was, was very sort of isolationist, I think. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah. the politics looked completely different. And then nine 11 happened and, and I, I, you know, and it was, that's why was, I panicked, I think in yeah. part, and it wasn't panic. It was just so much like oh, when nine 11 happened, I understood, okay, this guy who we all thought of as kind of this cowboy joke, Right. Who had kind of taken over through, 
you know, some sort of, you know, backroom Supreme Court deal, right. you know, uh, mysterious how all that happened, his yep. brother in Florida, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, I didn't really take it that seriously. I right. thought this guy will be just someone we make fun of. He's an idiot, you right. know. And even that, I mean, I was, again, like just the wrong image of him right. because, I mean, the image was he was, that he was a cowboy yokel. Right. And it's like, you know, this guy is from, you know, an elite family and, yeah. and, and went to Yale and is part of Skull and Bones and, yep. you know, is, is part of... Um, Really, the, the the kind of the, the elites that have been involved in some of the uh, biggest historical events of the last thirty years, and was surrounded by those people, right? Right. I mean, not just. I mean, the the Cheneys, the Wolfowitzes. Right. So when Rumsfelds, I didn't understand any of that, yeah. but when nine yeah. eleven happens, it's all of a sudden. You know, I remember getting a DVD of Noam Chomsky speaking about like right. I mean, they were putting them yeah. out like and selling them at I like remember. these uh, you know yeah. anarchist bookstores and yep. stuff like that. Well, this this yep. is in part why we need this shit because exactly right. I would go to these like like I mean I would go to uh, these head shops places where you mm-hmm. get Jimi hendrix posters and bongs yep. but they would have a little noam chomsky section absolutely with stuff yeah. with and, and and that was the entryway because you weren't going to find that anywhere else yep. and you saw this i don't know you probably remember this like little pamphlet chomsky put out right after 9 11 right that yep. had like washington square park on the front yep. with a tank yep. uh under the arch uh I th- at least that's the image i yeah. remember of it it might have been like military guys or something yeah. but yeah that caught my eye and that was it that that was you know how i i, I kind of started putting this together and realizing wow because the, the dvd i watched was chomsky talking about Look, all these people are from the Reagan administration. All mm-hmm. the people that Bush is surrounded by, we know what they're going to do. We know they have their eyes on the Middle East. Right. There's all this project for a new American century stuff. Mm-hmm. God, now I'm remembering. Like, yep. It all comes back. Yeah, right? and <laughs> so like people like us that, are, that remember this yeah. stuff are like, when the, the, the Trump thing, as much as like it's like, yeah, panic, Hitler, all this mm-hmm. stuff, it's also kind of like, well, I've seen this before. Yeah. Yeah, I, th- I absolutely. Um, and I mean, Including I, the, the, the guy being just a total like... You know, his personality is an asshole personality. Yeah, I've seen this before. Exactly. You know, and 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 yeah, and, and embracing or sort of embodying this kind of like split person. I mean, there's no, at the end of the day, like Donald Trump's like very clearly a smart guy in certain mm-hmm. key respects, mm-hmm. or he's figured something out. Yeah, you know, and largely sort of had a, as I would argue, George Bush was like in yes. in some ways, but but also at the exact same time is easy to make fun of. Clearly, seems kind of dumb and mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. sort of you know off the cuff and 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 not a serious person in some key respects. And so, yeah, I think I, I do feel like we're we're seeing a rerun. I mean, I I will admit to feeling extremely nervous. Um, Me too. I, I and what's I, going on, but I, I, I was kind of like uh, you know as much as I I tend to be like a a very cynical person that thinks mm-hmm. oh they're all the same and kind of thing when um. When I saw that, you know, the, the, the little New York Times ticker turned from like 95% pro, like that Hillary was going to yeah. win for like months and months and months. And then yeah. as soon as the polls opened, it, it immediately switched over to 95% chance Trump's yep. going to win. When I saw that, the, it, there was a bodily reaction where I literally felt nauseous and I thought like, I, I think I might actually throw up yeah. here. And like, I didn't expect that. And it tells me a little bit about myself, I think, internally. Because um, yeah, I'm fucking nervous as shit about what's going to happen too. Yep. Are you optimistic at all, too, though? Because the right wing governments tend to bring out like a lot of activism, too. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, you know, I, I, I hmm. <laughs> <laughs> how yeah. optimistic are you, Michael? <laughs> yeah, I don't I, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I don't know that I would frame it that way. I mean, I, I guess the things the things that I'm optimistic about, I think, have less to do with uh, with the incoming Trump administration, what that's likely going to sort of provoke on the left. Yeah. As I am optimistic that over the past like four years or whatever it's been now, five years, there's been this resurgent left. Yes. Um, and I think it's important to, to acknowledge that that's happened under Obama. It's yeah. happened under a, you know, a liberal democratic regime, not a, not a hard right one or, or anything sort of remotely. Well, I would argue Obama's a conservative, but, mm-hmm. but a, a right wing uh, movement. And, and the beautiful thing I think is, you know, you had Occupy, um, and and now you have sort of the the things that I have followed occupied like the Black Lives Matter movement, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, I've been to a ton of these protests and marches, and and now they're sort of taking the shape of the anti-Trump sort of uh, 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 idea, and and they're well organized. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're clearly um, being driven by people that have experience and that have have clear goals um, and know how to sort of put together a protest. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there's kind of this sort of accumulated knowledge over the past five years or so of like sort of how to do this well, how to mm. win small victories. Um, it's, it's knowledge that's being and, regained too in a lot exactly. of ways from like the, I mean, the activism in the 60s, mm-hmm. that, 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 that model might not be operative in the same way, but right. at the same time, there is this period where a lot of that, a lot of that knowledge was lost. Mm-hmm. That's why I bring up that stuff like yeah. the, you know, 
the the AIDS activism of the 80s because those were like successful movements. Yeah, they were focused, um, and and they 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 didn't win everything, but right. they won a lot they did. Um, against odds that were just incredible because most of the country didn't give a shit about this population. That's right. And in fact, yeah. thought they deserved their fate. Yep. Um, so yeah, I think there is a lot to hope about. And I think about like the Standing Rock thing that it kind of collapses a lot of the stuff we've been talking about in the sense that when the veterans showed up, right? right. Yep. Like you have this population of like veterans. And when I saw it, like, you know, I think like 2000 veterans yeah. show up to standing rock. And I mean, that's a population that, I mean, that's what I wrote my book about and, and uh, the, the a- activism by soldiers during the, uh, during the Vietnam years. And I know mm-hmm. that that, that population is a, is a potent one, not just in terms of their moral authority, but mm-hmm. in terms of just kind of getting shit done and being yeah. organized. And, uh, I don't know. I, I I want the veterans on our side yeah. as we're as we're moving forward here. Absolutely, yeah. And I, you know, just to, to return to something you said before. I mean, about the sort of the '60s thing and the '70s thing. Um, yeah, you're right. Like a lot of the knowledge is being sort of recovered in a lot of ways. But what's what's what I've been really fascinated by has been the degree to which sort of the 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 older members of the left have really mm-hmm. plugged right back into yeah. things. Um, and I find that extraordinarily heartening, right? That, that you've got sort of you've got young people, and you've got sort of the, the folks that are moving into sort of their their later years, kind of joining up. The, the veterans being another good example of this. Mm-hmm, like all mm-hmm. of these kind of different kind of categories of people are all sort of descending to the same place at the same time for for you know perhaps a variety of different sort of personal reasons or or ideological ones, but. I have to think that that's gonna that's gonna be extraordinarily important, sort of moving forward. I I worry though that at the exact same time that the you know the push against the right um, mm-hmm. uh, often historically and and it seems like it's already happening right now has not been particularly good for the left. Um, mm-hmm. I've been sort of, I mean, you know, I, I hate these conversations, but it, it it's striking to me just how sort of petty some of the arguments have been. You know, yeah. on the left. You know, sort of this like kind of like leftier than thou holy war, right? About who's who's the true leftist, and, and this stuff just you know it, who understands class more, who understands yeah, race more, who understands intersectionality yeah, more, exactly. And, yeah, and it just feels like it's not productive, yeah. um, and it and it also is engendering a tremendous amount of like of bad feeling, I think, between yeah. individuals that that really don't need to be fighting like this, um, and and I worry that that's that's going to continue, um, yeah. and. And so I think you know I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag. I think yeah, um, yeah. I think it's going to be it's going to be an intense number of years. I, I you know, it's I, an education. I think. I mean, yeah. it's going to be an education. It's like a, 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 and I think that if 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 we have a voice at all in that in shaping that, it's that it's that we've seen this before, mm-hmm. um, and and we know what worked then and what didn't. Um, and I mean, there's this Obama years also were the explosion of social media as a kind of a, yeah. a, a central site of political discourse, right. um, which has a, is a mixed bag. I think Absolutely. you would probably agree, right? Well, that's the thing I was thinking when you were talking about Standing Rock, um, and then back to our you know sort of the conversation a moment ago about sort of what happened during the Obama years. I, you know, social media may be one of like the linchpin to sort of thinking about both of those in the in the following way that. You know, what was remarkable about Standing Rock was as soon, you know, as soon as the veteran showed up and as soon as it really took hold as a Facebook phenomenon, yes, right, or like yes. a Twitter phenomenon, like, you know, all eyes were there and what was fabulous was the government effectively stood down, yeah. right, um, as governments are wont to do uh, during these types of moments, I think. Um, but the flip side of that and the thing that worries me is that, like, it's not over. Mm-hmm. Um, and But it's kind of being treated like it's over. Mm-hmm. Um, and You mean specifically the Standing Rock standing thing? Standing Rock, yeah. yeah. And, uh-huh. and, it's, and something similar to, you know, the like the Obama's presidency more broadly. It's like, you know, you've got these sort of points of outrage um, and these moments where people sort of like, oh, this isn't as, you know, he's not as progressive as I thought. Um, but then it kind of just, it, it's, it sort of dies away and is mm-hmm. usually replaced by something else, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that's, yeah, I think that that's, that's my big concern with the social media thing, which is that, you know, it gives a sense to people both of empowerment, which is good, but it also excuses people from really being a sustained sort of active member of this particular fight, yeah. you know, especially yeah. if they're at a remove from it. Right. Um, so those of us that aren't in Standing Rock, right, those of right. us that have never been and probably won't go or certainly not during this moment um, are really, really important. Uh, but I, but how to. Yeah, how to sustain and, and build pressure against the government and against kind of the the lobbying that these that these firms are doing in order to make these pipelines a real thing, whether you know on this particular site or someplace else. Yeah, that you impulse know, isn't going away, not right? At all. Yeah, yeah, and, and and that's why it's such. I mean, it's such a complex thing that we're going to be fighting. But uh, uh, 
it, we have to fight. Absolutely. I think that's. Yeah. I think it's. And 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 more and more people. Are, I think you know, young people especially because. And we've talked about this too. About that, like young people are like they're they're in many ways they're facing this future and they're exactly. they're living it. And and yeah. you feel like you get activism often um, from populations that are squeezed mm-hmm. like that. Yep. And 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 you know you don't hope for the squeeze so that the yeah. activism comes out. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's uh, it's it's kind of an important moment I think where where young people are going to be hopefully um, mm-hmm. more more engaged in 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 kind of confronting this stuff because it is is the, it's their lives right it's yeah, not just because like I mean you think about the civil rights movement all the like young white middle mm-hmm. class kids that joined the civil rights movement and right. like you know it, it, it was it was. It wasn't because they were conceiving that their own rights were threatened. It was, you know, in a lot of ways, it started as kind of like a, a, a movement to help others, yeah. um, but ultimately it turns into this kind of larger project. Right. Um, Michael Bush, thank you so much thank for you. joining me. Um, senior editor of Warscapes and and writer um, and CUNY graduate per, graduate center person, yes, which indeed. is the, the best thing of all that for me. It's <laughs> great to have a, a, another CUNY person on the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Okay, I am back. I want to thank my guest, Michael Bush. I had a great time talking with you, Michael. Uh, Warscapes, I, I think, is such an important project, and I, I, I can't say enough how much I think Nostalgia Trap listeners would appreciate Warscapes. Um, the perspectives, the writing, the, the, the whole presentation, it really is more than just war stories. It, it's, a, it's a publication that really makes you, makes you think about the whole context of the way we talk about war. So really, really great stuff, and thank you, Michael. I also want to thank the, the folks that are making the, the show sound so good. Uh, one is the band Chapo, which I think you're hearing right now, chapomusic.com. I also want to thank Peter Zabatino, who is an editor and producer extraordinaire, uh, and his skilled hand is making this, this show sound so much better. I really appreciate him helping me out with the show. So I hope you continue to download uh, these episodes directly into your devices or depending on what part of the future you're, you're listening to this in, um, directly into your own body. But either, either way, you can find all the episodes at nostalgiatrap.com. Uh, follow me on Twitter at David L. Parsons. I always have the latest episode pinned to the top. Thanks again. See you next time. 